So we really try to own the whole enterprise technology space. I mean, that's what we're all about. We take analysis, we take publishing, we take news, and we take live TV, and we combine it together in a product and share that with our community. No one's doing what we're doing. Uh, what we're doing, in my opinion, is the future of media, the future of television, future of the internet. Video is an amazing, powerful product. So we work in what John and I talk about as a data model. People always say to us, well, how do you guys make money? We sell knowledge, we sell information, we sell data. So the problem that we, are, that we identified is about what we call big, fast, total data. Anybody can analyze a gigabyte of data. If you do a thousand gigabytes, that's a terabyte of data. You take a thousand terabytes, that's a petabyte of data. A thousand petabytes, that's a zettabyte of data. So you are talking big data, lots and lots of data, and can you analyze it in real time as it comes in, right? The Cube is like we call ESPN of tech because we want to cover technology like ESPN covers sports. John has a great vision for what's going to happen next in tech. And so John is sort of that alter ego of mine that lets me see the future. We have a really amazing team of people that work with us. Michael Sean Wright, Mark Hopkins, you know, we've got Kim here today. We've got a team of people on our news desk uh, run by Kristen Nicole. So she has a team that help feed us the news of the day, what's happening, the analysis. We have a team of analysts, and they feed us information about what's happening. And then, really importantly, we have a community, a big community of, of many hundreds of contributors. We love technology, we love, we love the innovation, and that's what we do. We want to create a great user experience. And in order to do that properly, you've got to really, really prepare. The Cube for the past year that we've been in operation has been very, very successful. And uh, you know, companies do pay us to come here. I think the companies who bring us in with the Cube get two things. They get a third-party independent resource to provide knowledge to their audience who are seeking it, this demand for the, for the product. And also complements their existing media. Uh, we're here at an event and uh, you know, the company has their own TV organization and they have to pay a premium for that. So we complement that by offering a objective, organic, third-party, independent analysis of the event. That's why the top executives come in here. The Cube is a comfortable place. It's a place where people feel happy and are happy to share their knowledge with the world. And uh, we're happy to, to be ambassadors of, of that knowledge transfer. My entire career has been really built on relationships and talking to people and extracting knowledge from people, largely in a belly-to-belly -belly private forum. What theCUBE does is it explodes that to a huge audience. I mean, we've reached millions with theCUBE, and it's real time, it's live TV, so you've got to be quick on your feet, but you learn very fast, and then you iterate from that learning. So John and I play off of that, and we're constantly trying to up our game.
Okay, we're back live in San Francisco, California, here talking about the Node Summit, which is the inaugural event for Node.js and the community for developers, um, powered by Joint, which uh, acquired the inventor of Node.js, uh, Ryan Dahl, who, in just in the past few short years, has really uh, empower Joyant to drive massive valuation of their company, but more importantly, power a huge development community. Um, we're going to be talking to all the smart developers, students, entrepreneurs, executives here in San Francisco where this emerging trend is taking over the Web 2.0 performance category, in my opinion, and uh, we're going to hear about it. Um, next up will be Steve Herod from uh, VMware. A little echo there on the on the can't hear myself. Okay, here we go. Steve Herod from VMware is going to come on. Steve's a CUBE alumni, been on many times uh, at VMworld and all the events. CTO of VMware. We just heard from the CTO of the Apps Group uh, talking about Cloud Foundry, the inventor of Cloud Foundry. And, uh, you know, VMware is one of those companies, uh, as I mentioned earlier, um, probably along with YouTube, as probably the lowest uh, cost acquisition, most value it's produced. YouTube was bought by Google for $1.5 billion, has become a great story for Google. VMware was bought by EMC for $500 million and totally undervalued and is powering earnings for EMC, rocket earnings. VMware is the new platform for IT. And uh, with under Palmeritz's leadership, uh, VMware is uh, absolutely taking the uh, industry by storm. And obviously, they have competitors with like Amazon and Joyent now. So it'd be interesting to hear what uh, what Steve has to say. And uh, other news out there that we broke today that Mark Lewis, the head of EMC Ventures, steps down as the head of strategy for EMC and uh, head of uh, venture capital for EMC. He's going to be pursuing other interests. Um, other news, Mark Hopkins, we're going to try to get Dave Vellante in from Boston via Skype and try to get that uh, cu cut in here and get his perspective on what he thinks of the EMC announcements. Uh, but really the big story here is Node.js. Uh, it's a geek fest uh, here. All the alpha geeks in San Francisco, a lot of emerging companies from New York, all over the world coming to San Francisco to talk about Node.js. Really a framework built on, on, on top of JavaScript, a set of libraries that allows developers to become super developers. You take a front-end developer who knows JavaScript, you give them Node.js and they have instant back-end skills managing the hard stuff like networks, threads, and so on, mostly reserved for C, C++ programmers. So Node.js represents a fundamental shift in the developer community, a fundamental shift in onboarding new developers, new front-end developers, giving them some expertise in the back-end with cloud, and that the result of all that is more product, more applications, and better value. Uh, and I'd like to get Steve Harris' perspective on this when he comes on, uh, what it means for the technical community, uh, especially for developers. Because VMware owns Spring Source, and that was an ecosystem of developers around Java. So it'd be interesting take to get uh, the VMware perspective around Java versus Node.js, given the Spring Source acquisition. Um, so Steve is a good guy. When he's ready, we'll come in. Uh, his, uh, Mark Lewis, moving on to new, new, bigger, better things. Uh, is uh, Steve ready? Are you ready? Okay. That speaker, a little bit of echo on the speaker back there. Okay. Hey, how are you? Good to see you again. Looking good. Got the good, good color shirt on. Got the green for Node Summit. He was color coded. Here, sit right here. I brought a toy to show you. All right. Welcome back to the Cube. This is the twelfth time, uh, zillionth time on the Cube. Welcome, welcome back. Yeah, thanks. How, how you doing? been? Good. Doing great. We uh, we're here getting into the developer ecosystem here with Node Summit, and uh, you know, kind of people are like what's going on with Node. Um, I talked to some of my friends, kind of in the valley, um, not necessarily technical geeks. They're like, what's Node? Mm -hmm. um, so you have something, a phenomenon here, just in you know three short years. Yeah. Um, Node.js has come out of the woodwork. You know, obviously powered by cloud and joint, for example, just exploding with performance improvements for developers, kind of turning that front end developer into more of a computer scientist back end related mm -hmm. C threading, some complex stuff that, you know, most hardcore dudes would go for, back end guys, <laughs> right, as they right. call it. Um, what's your take on it? Well, it's exciting to be here. Obviously, it's, it's taking off very rapidly because it has some nice scalability properties, um, a really good way to do multi threading. Um, and it's, I think we talked about this about a year and a half ago. It's really, to me, part of this broader story of just a, almost a renaissance in the way people are writing applications. It's a world where there's new, uh, new languages, new services, and, and developers can be more productive than ever. You know, an individual developer can do things you would have never dreamed of an individual doing in the past. 
we had Derek on from Cloud Foundry. Obviously, Cloud Foundry was the conversation of VMworld, mm -hmm. dominated the Twitter stream and the, the you know, Clouderati and a lot of the elite tech guys arguing land grab for VMware. Obviously, Paul laid out his vision in 2010 at VMworld um, about the frameworks, and Spring Source was a big story at, during that VMworld. Right. Uh, what's changed within VMworld, if anything, or are you guys still on course? Obviously, Spring Source, Java-based community, you got JavaScript. What's, what's going on? How does this relate to that, or vice versa? Yeah, at the very top level, our, our overall theory is that this notion of cloud computing is changing absolutely everything, and we certainly see it, and we're best known for changing the way data centers are built and run, but it's also changing the way applications are written, and it's changing the way actually all of us consume them with new devices. So the context for VMware is that we really want to help enterprises get from where they are today to, to the promise that comes from these new frameworks and everything else. So Derek, you probably heard this morning, talked about uh, Cloud Foundry, which is our, we call it our open platform as a service, and uh, it's, it's really taking off quite quickly. We only launched it in April of last year, and if, if you track both developers and, more importantly right now, the community, uh, it's really getting a lot of traction as people see this as a, a great way to write applications. How about the big conversation around path to profitability, commercialization? You know, developers, not, they don't really sell out per se, but they also have the mind that they want to have a partner mm -hmm. that could take them across that bridge to success, meaning distribution of their product, um, what's, what are you seeing in the developer community around that? Obviously they want to have, they don't want to just build something and say, ah, it's only on Microsoft, it's only on this. Right. What's, what's, what's your take on that? Well, so we, we certainly aim to, uh, we are an enterprise company for sure. We, we focus on businesses and helping them consume the new technologies that are very commonplace for uh, consumers and in the web properties. So uh, we end up having a really nice relationship. Our whole goal is to take very innovative technologies like Node and really help accelerate their use in the enterprise by bringing Maybe it's, uh, it's levels of uh, security or even knowledge of things like compliance and, and things that are kind of boring uh, but very important to companies. And so that's why we end up having a really good relationship with the, with the newer frameworks coming along. I really do think we can accelerate their adoption in a, in a more conservative environment. What does Paul Moritz think about all this? I mean, he's, he's us hands in, in the cookie jar when it comes to geeking out on the architecture. Obviously, Node is it a threat, is it an opportunity. Obviously, you guys are embracing it uh, yeah. in, in Cloud Foundry. What's the vision on this in, in, in terms of disruption in future scenarios? Yeah, Paul's a great guy. I, I don't know if you ever had him interview. We're trying to get him on the cube. I just talked to Brian <laughs> Cox. He's going to try to send him an email. But oh, good. Paul, we're ready for you. You. No, we'll, Paul loves, we'll treat actually, you well. Paul showed me his Ruby program he wrote the other day. I couldn't believe our CEO was doing that. Um, <laughs> but no, uh, he, has a, he has a really good perspective on this. Obviously, from his time at Microsoft, he knows that it's really applications that drive a platform. And uh, in the same way, we are seeing this, this new world of having uh, new applications. You know, we obviously would like them to end up on VMware uh, virtualization systems and VMware-based clouds. But to, to succeed, the most important thing is that the developers like it. So his strategy and our strategy as a whole is very clearly, let's first of all make sure we're doing the best thing for developers, and then over time we will make sure that we are the best place to run it, or at least one of the best places, and, and that'll be how we pull together um, our own strategy for, um, for where we do want to make money in this space, but really it has to start with making sure the best way to write applications is on Cloud Foundry. How about the Spring Source? Any update there? What's their impact to this community? Obviously Java, JavaScript. There's been some debates around what Node.js could do versus mm -hmm. other com com competing up approaches like, yeah. like what Java can do. Well, I think one thing that, uh, that a number of people here have talked about and we certainly believe are that real big applications headed forward are not, you know, they're, they're polyglot, I think is the phrase everyone's using right now. But they're not te uh, just one system that's a monolithic app. They tend to be a number of services pulled together. And, and some of those will be written in Java, some might be written in Node. And I think that's really where things are headed. So we, we don't see them in any way competitive. In fact, um, you know, the Spring Group is really focusing on how can it reach out and interact with other languages and services. And both, uh, both Node and Spring and many other frameworks right now are looking at the best way to consume Redis or MongoDB or a lot of the new application services that are coming together. So we're really, we're focused on making Spring the best way to do Java. We're focused on making Cloud Foundry the best place for Spring as well as for Node. Um, Node.js is it's early, so it's an emerging, you know, young, infant language, but it's getting massive traction as we talked about. What things do you see that, that you, you would do to add to the to success of Node in terms of what does it need to work on? Like a, you know, like a toddler growing up, it's you know, still not found its legs yet truly in my opinion, and uh, obviously we're seeing commercial deployments, LinkedIn's using it for some of their mobile apps, and we're hearing about some other success stories mm -hmm. that Joyance parading around, but well, you know, from, from your perspective, from VMware, say, okay, this is a good trend, mm -hmm. developers like it, hackers are hacking on it, 
it's good with the cloud. Great, right. got that. What's what does it need to work on? If you could if you could put the Steve Harrod, you know, poke in the fire there, what would you add to Node? Well, I think it's on a great trajectory, and it's it's a slightly different way of thinking of how you write a program. And multi-threading is what makes it scalable from the start. You know, I think it's it is so early that a lot of what you're going to see work on is how do you make it embrace other other languages and other services that are out there and make them extremely consumable. And I think that's what every language goes through as it starts to move forward. I think uh, there's a very rich community, obviously, much more uh, active community than you'd expect for something at this level. So I think the community yeah. itself is going to decide what's most important and making sure it stays open and that a lot of people can contribute will be well, how it gets there. What's your opinion about the entrepreneur's opportunity out there? I say I talked to a lot of the Node Jam companies last night when um, at the uh, meetup over there, and and there's two types of startup categories that I'm seeing: the Me Too collaborative social app. I'm going to do something that looks like everything else with chat and blah blah blah, and then kind of real programming going on around white spaces around solutions in the IT world because the IT world is broad. Mm -hmm. What's different from the consumer side is that you know one hit wonders, only one Twitter, there's only one Facebook, mm -hmm. so you put everything in and those guys invest there. IT's got a lot of white space, so right. what do you see um, to kind of uh, share with those entrepreneurs out there that are good white spaces that Node is perfect for? No. Uh, well, I think you can't go to any enterprise right now who is not worried, for instance, about how applications can become mobile. So I, I go to many companies that have that existing application It works only in the browser or maybe it even has a, an old Windows type of framework around it. But I do think there's a huge niche for the development tools that can help companies either make existing applications mobile friendly or go directly and create those new mobile applications themselves. So that's a clear one. I think the other one is, uh, is obviously looking at companies that have a lot more of their systems coming together in one place. So the notion of a easy way to achieve scale is also something that would come in. So the white space is certainly the tools and the language itself, but I think also uh, the, the consulting and really getting out there and helping companies understand how to use it the best. So I was talking with our team um, a couple weeks ago, and we're talking about you know, Silicon Academy, a site we're trying to get off the ground, uh, looking for funding, so anyone uh, <laughs> who wants to donate, uh, uh, give us some cash. Um, but really it's about this, this void of, of skill set, and you know, it, you, if you're a developer and you know CSS, and you know back end, you're a rock star, you're not going to be unemployed for less than a New York Okay, we're back in theCUBE in San Francisco live at the Node Summit. Node Summit in San Francisco is a place, obviously San Francisco, groundbreaking on all fronts these days. Uh, all the new tech is happening in San Francisco, the startups, the developers, and we're here uh, with Oren Teich, the COO of Heroku, recently acquired by Salesforce. Great success story in San Francisco, pioneered a lot of the work going on in cloud, developers, and really allowed people to really pump their apps out and get in the marketplace, create a lot of value for shareholders, employees, developers, or and you, uh, you're excited. Uh, what's going on? Tell us what's happening. Yeah, you're smiling. I, you bet. It's, yeah. a, it's an amazing job. It's an amazing company. It's an amazing place to be. We, uh, you know, there's some really amazing. What, what does that mean, right? It's always interesting to talk about metrics. So, uh, actually, today, just totally coincidentally, but today, you go to Heroku.com, the homepage. We crossed a million apps deployed on the platform today, and um, I think even more impressively, we've got over 1.1 million deploys every single month going on right now. So people just love this platform. They are using it left and right. You know, I love I love the cloud and, and uh, you know, as an entrepreneur and I talk mm -hmm. to developers all the time, the word enablement, you know, enable success. You know, that's kind of a buzzword. You guys really have done that. So take us through you know, some quick, you know, the Reader's Digest version of the history of Heroku and some of the key things you guys done because you guys were a real enabler for developers. And just take us through some of the highlights, high moments of, of uh, what you guys have done over the past three years, obviously now with Salesforce. But uh, I'll go back a little bit because you've been in the cloud business you know, you've known the market for a long time, and just give us a quick highlights of those enablements. Yeah, yeah, uh, so four years ago when Heroku got founded by uh, three guys, James, Adam, and Orion, they're the three co-founders of Heroku, it actually started as an online IDE. Uh, so the, the idea was developers have all this passion, they want to get things done, but it's just too hard, right? That getting started problem was just too hard. So we started off with an online IDE, and pretty quickly, and, and, and just, got an amazing traction and then pretty quickly realized that you know there's actually a really interesting problem here which is not just the development side but actually the deployment side 
So yeah, you know, the reality is that you know, here you are, you're sitting with a Mac, and the experience of developing has just gotten better and better there, but then you hit this brick wall. What do you do from there? And so Heroku, to really use a buzzword, pivoted and started to focus on the deployment side of things. And, and that's kind of when uh, you know, the fire got lit. So that was uh, three years ago now, and since then we've just been uh, growing like mad, doing outstanding. Um, and really what it's about for us is it's about focusing on the developer, 100% on the developer. So what that means is, you know, how do you make sure that it's within their workflow, using their tools, using their experience? How do you make sure that every time you ever make a decision, you put the developer first? And it's resonated. You know, we've just seen developers continue to respond to that every single time. So take us through the key, key uh, aha moment for the developers. Is it, is it ease of use? Is it, is it efficiency, all the above? What's the key thing that you can point to that really knocked it out of the park? I'd actually say it's design. And design, what I mean when I say the word design is what I mean is you need to think about an intent and then ensure that everything is aligned around that. So a really simple, really concrete example of that would be how do you deploy your application to Heroku? You know, when you think about this problem, you have a set of source code, again, running locally on your laptop, and you want to get that somewhere else. You want to get that up into the cloud. How do you do that? So before we were around, oh, you'd FTP it and you'd use these different tools, and we realized this is insane, right? What you really want to do is you want to work into, you want to design into the existing developer workflow. And so Heroku invented the idea of using Git as a deployment mechanism. We were the very first people to do that, right? So Git push Heroku master, one line, and then you are using the existing tools you're using and you're deploying into a very, very simple uh, mechanism to do that. And so to me what that's about is it's this designed idea. You take a concept and then you design every interaction point to be holistic and aligned with that original goal. Wow. So I'm really excited about what you guys have done because like a bunch of other companies that are out there doing this work, there's, there's the early adopters, the pioneers, the Facebooks, the Twitters, the Harukus, the Joyants, you know, the, the, the guys that get swallowed up by the big whales like EMC and Salesforce because they're just so valuable. Um, but this notion of engineering and operations kind of converging together really has been a, a phenomenon of the, of, the, of the cloud, public cloud, the Amazon kind of DNA where you know, operations is development. So yes. we're launching this week uh, a new publication called DevOps Angle. Dot com, uh, plug for our SiliconANGLE network growing media empire. Um, but you're in that, you've been there for a long time, you guys have DevOps guys who are religious about this. Can you share with folks out there what you think this DevOps movement is? Because you know, I talked with Jonathan, uh, the guy who used to run Facebook, who's now on his own. Um, it's very clicky and these guys talk to each other because there's only a few companies really pioneering DevOps and it's Facebook. It's guys who have these provisioning of hardware, huge growth curves. Um, what is DevOps and what does it mean to like an IT department who's like, nah, slow? You know, I, I think that the best person to ask could actually be someone who works for me. So I want to maybe give you a slightly different perspective, which is as an executive side, what does it mean for my company? Because the reality of like, what's DevOps? I have a team of people who are look, who are living that life, but I don't. And so, uh, can you get him on the queue? I could. We okay, could absolutely good. get him here. Yeah. All right, Mark Hopkins, we'll get on that. Right, Mark Imbriaco. <laughs> he's the one you want to talk to if you want to know like exactly what DevOps is. But what I can say is what it means for a business. But it's a real trend. I mean, can you it is, elaborate yo, yeah. on that? I think it's a real. It, not only is it a real trend, it's something that uh, really enables us. So the fact that we live a DevOps life, the fact that, and, and what does that mean, right? What that means is that developers are responsible for what they write. What it means is that operations needs to work with you to enable the business, not to, uh, before I joined Heroku, I don't know, the, in the industry they often hear about the TNT guys, the no team, right? And that's not Ops's role here. Ops's role is an enablement. They're, they're part of the, the business. The no team. The no team, <laughs> TNT. Never go to the TNT guys. <laughs> They'll blow it all up. So, um, you know, and, and it's about changing that mindset. And so what we've seen for us is it means that we're deploying multiple times every single day continuously. It means that the engineers are empowered to own exactly what they need to own and not be like, oh, do I need to check here, do I need to check here? It's, no, it's my responsibility and it's my responsibility for quality as well. So I can't just put something out there and then throw it over the wall and expect someone else to make sure that this is ultimately going to work. And what it means for our business is, frankly, a, a velocity that we would never have done what we did without this. It would have been flat out impossible for our business to exist if this isn't the way we operated. And why is that? Uh, speed. We, we, uh, we have, so today we're, we're uh, getting close to 100 people, but back when Salesforce bought us, we were uh, just a few dozen people. 
And if you look at the velocity and the set of features and capabilities that we've put out over that time, it's really, I think, unmatched. You know, we, we have changed the definition of what it means to be in platform as a service. And that came about because of our ability to innovate and release quickly. Um, there was a platform as a service panel out there today. The electric was saying nothing really was being said there. What's the state of the platform as a service marketplace? Is there a marketplace? Um, is it being commoditized? Where's the value being created in this platform as a service business? Oh, well, as a panel, of course nothing was being said. <laughs> <laughs> Not only, we say it on the queue, but I mean, okay, I'll, I'll be more critical. What's going on with platform as a service? You know, because there's one school of thought, it's the race to zero, depending on how you look at it, and there's also construction of value at the top of the stack where you want to build more applications or expose more APIs, and, and the fear for people is I don't want to be a tool company, right? So I'm a developer, I'm like, I don't want to be a tool, I want to be part of a platform. So there's some contention around this platform as a service business model. Um, what are you seeing there? Do you have a perspective? Yeah, I do. I, I have a perspective which says that there's never been a single instance of where a new abstraction layer hasn't fundamentally reshaped what the world we look at is. And so platform as a service is a new layer of abstraction. This is a new, higher level way of, of uh, developers engaging in writing code. And history has shown that to always, well, Okay, maybe I can think of one or two fail starts, but you know, the, the, uh, there's definitely quite a bit of momentum behind that. And so, yeah, I think it's a tricky space. We'll, here's my take, a decade from now, we will, no questions asked, be looking back and saying, absolutely, platform as a service has changed what it means to create applications. Now, of course, I believe it's Roku, but it could be us, it could be someone else, it could be someone on the panel, or it could be someone who doesn't exist yet. That's, you know, now we're starting to get into corporate politicking and, and, yeah, yeah, and yeah. boostership, right? But I do fundamentally believe this new layer of abstraction, this new way of thinking. You said you, you don't want to be a tools or other thing. I, I look, this is about developers. I, I, I hate to do it, right? but the Steve Ballmer quote, it may be old, 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 but right, developers, developers, developers. And someone even on Twitter was making fun of that. But you can make fun of that. At the end of the day, it's true. It's yeah. fundamentally true. And I, I've been a developer a long time. Developers' lives often are terrible. The, the experience of how you're actually working is terrible. And we can make this so much better and enable so much more value for the businesses. And I think that's what PASS is about. So yeah, there's, there's no question, this is going to change everything. Yeah. What does PASS mean for, uh, for the operations team, though? Uh, are there jobs going away, being outsourced to, to the cloud, to, to PASS providers, and to, I, to inter, uh, infrastructure providers is you know, Europe. Right. I mean, you're running on Amazon. Right. So even even at your la layer, there's a, a certain amount of outsourcing going on. That's right. That's right. I, I think it all comes to business value. To me, is, is actually what this is about. So, what is the goal of ops? I would argue that the goal of ops is not to deploy an app. That that's not your job. Your job is to enable applications to run effectively within the constraints of your business, and so. People have crossed these wires and said, oh, no, 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 my job is to watch that console and make sure that that light never turns red, but they're missing the actual business value, and CIOs all around are really frustrated because they're not able to deliver the business value, and they're constantly thought of as a cost basis. Mm -hmm. What this actually lets these teams do is actually start to focus up, the, up that value chain. So the very same people now, when you're freed up from doing some stuff that you don't need to do anymore, you're enabled to deliver on that value side. Yeah, they and can we're seeing a, that. a profit center instead of a cost center. Potentially, absolutely. They can become a, I, that's so much structured around the business side of things, but I will right. say is they can become delivering value, right? And I actually think VMware did an amazing job with their virtualization layer for enabling a team of people who used to always be saying no to giving to value and delivery services, right? Now all of a sudden with virtualization, these teams were able to say, oh yeah, I can have a disaster recovery plan for you. I can give you all these business features. Now we're enabling them to go to the next level. This new level of abstraction lets these same ops people now say, oh yeah, I'm actually monitoring things like how your application performance is going. I'm actually monitoring the portfolio of applications to make sure that these are operating the way we expect them to. And that, I think, is just pure money for everyone involved. Hey, uh, since we're at Node Summit, I uh, think we should maybe talk about Node.js a little bit. Uh, Node.js was one of the first languages besides Ruby that you supported Number two. on Heroku. All right, it was, and you were one of the very first yeah. platforms as a service to offer a beta, beta support for Node.js. So why was Node.js the, the second thing that you, that you rolled out? Developers. Plain and simple as developers. Uh, we, we listen to what the groundswell of interest is. 
and what we were hearing loud and clear, and to be fair, it's, it's a developer on our side who heard this. Blake mm -hmm. Miserani is the creator of Sinatra, and he was like, man, this Node thing is amazing. I can't believe what you can do with this language. We have to support it. And we listen. Right? It's, it's, we listen to those bleeding edge. We listen to what people like Blake say, and, and we follow in them and make sure that we're making the developers happy. How much traction has Node.js gotten on your platform? Incredible traction. It's, it's the second most popular language on the platform to date. And uh, if you consider that to use Node on Heroku is actually not the default path, right? The default mm -hmm. path is still to use Ruby. So if you consider that it's still not the default path, people have to opt in, they have to choose to use it, they have to do an extra step. It's incredible the traction we're seeing, just absolutely mind boggling. Are there any customers that you can talk about that are using uh, Node.js on Heroku? I'm actually kind of frustrated in that um, they've all been very private. This is, a, this is always a challenge. I can talk in general. Like, There's one customer that's doing this incredible, incredible app. It's actually, I, I was mentioning during the panel, what they're doing is a machine-to-machine -machine app. So this isn't like a, a web page you go to or an API backend for a phone. What they actually have is they have a distributed system that this customer is themselves running. And this distributed system is actually using a component on Heroku to manage the distributed system itself. And so you have this distributed system with a component running on Heroku, and they're doing mind-boggling traffic. I, uh, they, if this was a website, they would be in like the top 20 websites in, in the uh, world kind of traffic. Wow. And this is just a machine-to-machine -machine distributed systems component that they're running. And so we're seeing some just really amazing, amazing things. And this is, this is from a, a public multi-billion dollar company that's, that's running on, on Heroku just can't say who they are right now. Uh, and so there's that. Of course, there's also people who are doing, um, there's actually a really interesting uh, iPad backend, for example. Someone has a, an app that does all sorts of interesting image processing, and the backend of that's all running on Heroku. Um, so you know, a wide range of things that are going on right now. Okay. Well, I uh, just want to throw one uh, harder question at you, I guess, before we have to sign off. Uh, there was, I saw a lot of skepticism on, on Twitter earlier when you announced that you had passed one million applications, someone was like, how many of those are cat.jpg or, you know, some sort of hello world <laughs> right. app that's on for, for the Facebook platform. Uh, so a while back, um, Engine Yard had suggested that a better metric for how much business a, a platform as a service is doing might be uh, CPU cycles instead of a oh. uh, number of apps deployed. Uh, that, I think that's actually, that, if you're saying that, you don't understand platform as a service? I'm, I might be misremembering uh, which met well, I would say what the metric that matters was, was, whether it was CPU cycles or if it was uh, some but it was it was some you know some quantifiable uh, machine metric rather but, than I, I agree uh, than number of than just number of apps right so I agree I would say that what what matters keep in mind pass is about abstraction if we're talking about infrastructure as a service, we should be talking about CPU or memory or network. But if we're talking about pass, we should be talking about developers. So something machine, that makes a lot of sense. So the metric I'm going to give you is deploys. What more could you ask, right? This isn't like hello world, this isn't cat.jpg. Mm -hmm. If you're doing a deploy, you are by definition engaging and actively using the platform, right? And so Heroku is doing 1.1 million deploys every single month right now. Well, Actually, it's more than that. In the past 30 days, we're di we've done 1.1 million deploys, and that number is just accelerating. So that's not that's not hello world, or if it is, it's people deploying hello world and iterating over and over on their again. app, yeah. right? which actually isn't the case. What this debugging is, is hello world. The debugging hello world, right? So what we're seeing is <laughs> real use cases of people really engaging with and modifying and deploying and iterating on those real applications. And so you know, 1.1 million of those a month is it's a real number. John, did you have any other questions for him? Um, just kind of quick update before we uh, go to the next guest. What's next for you guys? Obviously, the question everyone wants to know is, what's it like at Salesforce? Yeah. Um, we know you guys had a race to do a lot of stuff um, that some would call medieval for Heroku standards, you know, Java, et cetera, and things that you were working on. What's it like there now? I mean, you guys getting along? Is it cool? I mean, obviously, Salesforce is acquiring, and they got some mojo. They're going they social, going social data. So what's the status of the Salesforce? So integration. I, I feel like before I answer that straight, I'm going to come across as a shill. So I need to give you just one background, which is I've been through another acquisition before. Yeah. I came out here in 99, and that acquisition was a disaster. Really bad. So coming from, I, I actually shed a tear when I heard about the acquisition. I was really afraid of how bad this could go. And the simple reality is, it's been amazing. Unquestionably, the company has been supportive. Salesforce is an amazing company. But here I am, I'm part of it, so everyone, everyone who's watching is like, yeah, 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 blah, blah, blah. 
the only thing that matters is the results. So the ultimate question is how when you go to Heroku.com, when you attend our events, when you speak to us, when you use our platform, what do you think? Right? I, it's easy for me to say we're all about the developers, but let me put it back. It's easy for me to say it's going great. I'm going to ask the developer community. Hop on Twitter, talk to us, you know, make sure. Do you think we're doing an amazing job? I, I really believe the answer is yes. So you guys get good reviews. Speak. And you know, Benioff's great because you know, we had Oracle World, we covered his unconference yep. keynote because yep. he did the whole, and I streamed it live, so it was great. Uh, he's a founder. He's around, he's hanging around, he's, he's got a lot amazing. of passion. Uh, he's very authentic. I talked to him a lot on Facebook. He's responsive. Yep. Um, that's, a, that's a cool culture. It's am I, we need to keep in mind, uh, again, from a developer perspective, so many people are like afraid of money. And Benioff is someone who is shown the way to, as a founder to make a real business and to recognize how you don't need to compromise. You don't need to be a slimy bastard. You can do things well and nicely and still be effective. And you know he's outrageous. He's a philanthropist. He donated That's a lot right. of money to this uh, medical facility here it's at incredible. the Mission area. So he's been great. Uh, you guys had a great run doing good things at Salesforce. Just that together over there with the cloud. Congratulations. Thank you. And uh, we look forward to uh, collaborating with you guys on, on DevOps Angle. You Thanks bet. for your support. Thanks Thank for you coming on theCUBE. Orin the CEO, Thank COO you. of Heroku. Thanks for coming on theCUBE. We'll be right back in five minutes. Thank you. The Cube is this conceptual box, if you will, and we bring people inside of the Cube and then we share ideas, but those ideas don't stay inside the Cube. We explode that idea. We allow that idea to grow and grow, and it does. So we really try to own the whole enterprise technology space. I mean, that's what we're all about. We take analysis, we take publishing, we take news, and we take live TV, and we combine it together in a product and share that with our community. No one's doing what we're doing. Uh, what we're doing, in my opinion, is the future of media, future of television, future of the internet. Video is an amazing, powerful product. So we work in what John and I talk about as a data model. People always say to us, well, how do you guys make money? We sell knowledge, we sell information, we sell data. So the problem that we are that we identified is about what we call big, fast, total data. Anybody can analyze a gigabyte of data. If you do a thousand gigabytes, that's a terabyte of data. You take a thousand terabytes, that's a petabyte of data. A thousand petabytes, that is zettabyte of data. So you are talking big data, lots and lots of data, and can you analyze it in real time as it comes in, right? The cube is like we call ESPN of tech because we want to cover technology like ESPN covers sports. John has a great vision for what's going to happen next in tech. And so John is sort of that alter ego of mine that lets me see the future. We have a really amazing team of people that work with us. Michael Sean Wright, Mark Hopkins, you know, we've got Kim here today. We've got a team of people on our news desk uh, run by Kristen Nicole. So she has a team that help feed us the news of the day, what's happening, the analysis. We have a team of analysts and they feed us information about what's happening. And then, really importantly, we have a community, a big community of, of many hundreds of contributors. We love technology, we love, we love the innovation, and that's what we do. We want to create a great user experience. And in order to do that properly, you've got to really, really prepare. The Cube for the past year that we've been in operation has been very, very successful. And uh, you know, companies do pay us to come here. I think of companies who have bring us in with the Cube 
get two things. They get a third party independent resource to provide knowledge to their audience who are seeking it, this demand for the, for the product. And also complements their existing media. Uh, we're here at an event and uh, you know, the company has their own TV organization and they have to pay a premium for that. So we complement that by offering a objective, organic, third party, independent analysis of the event. That's why the top executives come in here. The Cube is a comfortable place. It's a place where people feel happy and are happy to share their knowledge with the world. And uh, we're happy to, to be ambassadors of, of that knowledge transfer. My entire career has been really built on relationships and talking to people and extracting knowledge from people, largely in a belly-to-belly -belly private forum. What theCUBE does is it explodes that to a huge audience. I mean, we've reached millions with theCUBE, and it's real time, it's live TV, so you've got to be quick on your feet, but you learn very fast, and then you iterate from that learning. So John and I play off of that, and we're constantly trying to up our game. First time on the cube, baby. Rock and roll. Well, I think it's probably five or six times I've been on the cube now. Right, and, you know, at first, the guys are just fun to work with. Pat, welcome back. Hey, always a pleasure to be in the cube. <laughs> hey, I'm about to go on the cube. You never know what's going to happen. I'm, uh, a three-time veteran of being on the Cube. Uh, I hope many, many more. Chad Sackets, Chad, welcome to the Cube. Dave, John, it's great to be here, man. I keep coming back because uh, great, insightful questions from uh, from uh, John and from Dave. What face-melting action have you seen here at the event? And I know there's a lot of it. It's a great vehicle to uh, to communicate with a broad audience. A lot of folks watch. Great to have you back. Good job. All right, Craig Nunez, uh, VP of Marketing at HP Storage. Thanks very much for coming on theCUBE. Yeah. When people mention theCUBE, they, they're like, oh my God, I saw you on theCUBE. And they're all excited about it. It's, it's, a, it's an experience. It's not just information. They experience kind of what's going on there. It's like real time. It's like they were there. That was like my going to the pleasure. gym. Boom, boom. Legendary IBMer, CEO of Symantec, and now CEO of Virtual Instrument. Uh, great to have you on the Cube. So for Cube to be here at a conference like this, that's got 15, 20,000 people, and sharing that live around the world, that's consistent with the way the, the world is evolving. So it's a wonderful medium, wonderful medium. John and Dave are amazing. I don't know how they keep everything in their heads the way they do. Uh, it's a great format, and we're obviously seeing that this notion of real-time coverage and a real conversation is what's driving us as a company. And I, I said very seriously, when the questions and the comments that we hear from from them and from all the different guests here directly turn into the products that we build. Yeah, that was my first Cube and uh, I really enjoyed it. There was the oh, rapid fire of questions. It made me think on my feet, but they were very thought provoking and really got me going on analyzing the, the greatness of Arista and the greatness of the Cube as well. John and Dave, the reason their approach works, they're not just guys you know, reading down the question list, right? Okay, next one, next one. They're, they're, it's a conversation, right? And it's, you know, they're going to challenge you. They're not going to settle for the, the marketing hype and the BS and all that that stuff that the industry throws around. Come on, you got to hit him up on the HP question. A lot's changed at HP, some turmoil at the top, obviously, controversy. They're going to hold you down to the, the, the real facts.
Okay, we're back live in San Francisco, California, the Node Summit. Uh, Node.js is the story here. I'm John Furrier, the founder of SiliconAngle.com, SiliconAngle.tv, and uh, we're excited to bring you wall-to-wall -wall coverage of the interviews at Node Summit, entrepreneurs, developers, executives. Um, you know, we're all about getting the knowledge and sharing it with you via social media, and uh, my guest here is an entrepreneur, Joe Farner, who's the CEO and founder of uh, Inbound. Uh, uh, Inbox Q is in, a company, Inbound Score is a new product. Though. Inbound so, Score is a new product, Inbox Q, big data meets social web, meets connecting into the web. So uh, here, step up to the microphone yeah, a little bit absolutely. there, and let's talk about, uh, um, you guys are startups, so you're seed funded, sure, and right. you're out in the marketplace trying to make things happen. That's exactly right. Well, what's the big uh, aha around big data and the new marketplace that we're living in right now? You know, so uh, we've been working on our product set for about a year and a half. Um, we started uh, down a different path, more uh, real-time web crawling, crawling, and then we started focusing in on social data. What we started to isolate is around two concepts. One is the concept of public data streams, so things like Twitter and some of the public Facebook data and making sense of that. And more recently, really trying to figure out what are these more private data streams that are proprietary to within companies typically and helping folks make sense of those. So an example with, uh, with our Inbox Q product, we focus on making sense of public Twitter data. With Inbound Score, we've started to focus on looking at these proprietary streams of data that businesses have coming into their sites like Inbound Sales Leads and helping them make sense of those using some uh, public, public data as well. So obviously the social web is uh, an environment that's really hot with this real-time node.js. And, and uh, you know, one of the things we talked about earlier with the CEO of uh, Heroku and the CTO mm -hmm. of Heroku and pretty much everyone else is, the new connected internet is changing everything. Absolutely. So there's a lot more lightweight data that's actually worth storing and using and it's being disruptive. What do you guys see in your area around big data meets social data? And so, it's a disruptive force. Yeah, so one of the real big things that we're seeing with our clients, particularly in the enterprise, is they're trying to figure out how to make sense of that data. So there's been this, this first, and make it actionable, this first wave of like listening apps, things that uh, allow you to understand what's going on on these channels. And now folks are starting to move their focus in around, how do I take the data that I'm taking out of a place like Twitter or Facebook and tie that directly to a business objective, whether that's a product launch, direct sales, lead generation, whatever it may be. So what's your product and what's your business model? So uh, with Inbound Score, the product um, helps businesses manage their inbound leads better. So effectively what we do is we take that inbound stream of leads that's coming from your website uh, contact form, we look at the email address and the domain associated with that, that lead, and then we um, append public and private data to that, and we charge folks for uh, processing those leads in that way. Um, and where are you guys going? What's the next step for you guys? Obviously, you score more funding, right. get some beachhead out there. What are the critical product challenges you have? Yeah, so I think um, we've spent the last year and a half in product development and really trying to understand the market. Now we're moving into the phase where we're actually you know, shipping products, selling, uh, building our early customer base. The next phase is really figuring out what are the assets we need to scale up into a big, massive, successful business. And so we think that that's proving the early business model and then you know raising additional capital around that and, and starting to scale up. So how did this all get started, you guys? How did you meet your co-founders and yeah, so, team. Yeah, uh, so it's interesting. Uh, my co-founder and I worked together at a previous startup, um, an early social startup called Popular Media that did uh, viral distribution for consumer products. Uh, it, was, it predated uh, Twitter's mass adoption. It predated Facebook uh, becoming open beyond yeah, education. Yeah, that was the so, widget craze. Remember that's right. That it, was all, it was widgets and all email based. <laughs> Everything was email importers, right? Um, and so I worked, uh, you know, I tell people in lots of startups, there's like the yeah. traditional uh, org chart and there's the shadow org chart. The shadow org chart is like the people they pull together when things need to get done and increasingly it was me and my co-founder getting pulled together on these shadow projects. So he finally said, you know, we should just do this together. Um, we were part of Y Combinator about two years ago uh, and uh, that was an amazing, amazing education and got us kind of focused on the social path and then uh, spent the last two years executing from there. Okay. And when did you guys get your first funding? So we raised funding in uh, May 2010. So about a, a, little, a little over uh, a year and a half ago. And, like a uh, Series A? Or? It was, a, well, I think some people call it Series A, some people call it a seed. We're probably a small Series A or a big seed. Oh, yeah, preferred. Then, that's, right. preferred that's right, stuff. that's right, yeah. yeah. And, uh, and so we basically, uh, and then you know, we've sort of just been uh, focusing on, on putting that to good use and, and cool. developing the right product. And yeah. you know Tim Connors, great guy. Absolutely. An investor in the company. Yeah. Tim's an amazing guy, amazing product guy. Product, he's very founder friendly, which is you know my kind of VC, and mm -hmm. uh, 
He's a sports fan, which right. we love Absolutely. sports at Silicon Angle. We run reruns, and you know the funny story about Silicon Angle. I was running some high school football content on Silicon Angle TV, and didn't know it was on live, mm -hmm. and it was on the website. And people were like, hey, you got football highlights on there. All of a sudden, the number the number of uniques doubled. <laughs> right. it's like right. high school football <laughs> on a tech blog. It's just all, and it was all the offensive plays of Palo Alto High School, and it's got awesome. massive traffic. So we love sports, and we'll soon be launching Sports Angle. Uh, a Very dedicated cool. sports thing. That's our next big thing. That's what I want to do. But I don't Excellent. know if we're going to have time. Well, Joe, <laughs> thanks for coming in. Uh, entrepreneur in San Francisco. Uh, as you can tell, San Francisco is a place where you know, everyone hangs loose. The startups are very collaborative, a lot of experimentation. The Node.js is a real trend. Uh, highly accelerating path to market and uh, time to value for the startups, and it's an exciting opportunity. Thanks for coming on theCUBE. Well, thank you very uh, much for having me, John. Okay, we'll be right back in five minutes with uh, Top Dog at Yahoo, large scale systems to talk about Yahoo's challenges. Okay, we're back live inside theCUBE. 
our flagship telecast where we go out to the events and talk to the, the smartest entrepreneurs, developers, executive geeks, entrepreneurs, whoever we can find to, to get the information and share that with you. We're here live in the Node Summit in San Francisco where Node.js is having its inaugural kind of geeky meets business conference. Um, it's not pure developer conference, but it's pretty much the geeks building out a new industry. It's really cloud focused, cloud developer, DevOps, um, and uh, I'm John Furrier, the founder of SiliconAngle.com, SiliconAngle.tv, and we'll be launching DevOps Angle, a new vertical, this week, so look for that on SiliconAngle.com or DevOpsAngle.com, and we're going to cover all the angles of, of DevOps, and I'm here with Bruno Fernandez Ruiz from Yahoo. Now, what's your title? I'm a Vice President and Architect Fellow on the Platform Group. So, Vice President, so you're, you're a top guru over there on the large scale side. Um, Todd P, Dr. Lucky Spin was the cloud guy earlier at Yahoo. He's gone doing his new, new thing, he just announced a startup. So, uh, Yahoo's huge. We're not going to talk about the Yahoo conversations that everyone else is talking about, which is new CEO from Stonehill, Massachusetts, my neck of the woods, um, or any of the other stuff. But we're going to get more into the geeky side of Yahoo. Huge infrastructure. Uh, a lot of volume, a lot of traffic, a lot of cloud, a lot of large scale. Uh, just to keep the lights operational is pretty complex. Can you just share with us some of the geeky complexity involved in what's going on over there right now? Yeah, so one of the things you need to look at is 21 billion page views daily. It's, it's a lot of page views, and they're only the likes of Facebook and Google and maybe Amazon that really drive that. And those are not just static impressions, but actually you have to compose a page, there's a lot of recommendations, targeting, personalization happens on the page. It's not just one little node on the stack, it's actually many layers on the stack that are doing analytics, that are doing ranking, that are doing search, that are doing content management. And putting all of that together for 700 million users it's, is the complexity of running big, large distributed systems that can fail at any moment, hardware failures are constant, network failures are constant, um, and you have to design for failure. So, in this Node Summit, Node.js is the new black, if you will, on the developer community. It has a real-time element to it. They talk about kind of being a programming environment for people who don't want to be a threading guru or a low-level programmer. Uh, what's your take on that? I mean, what do you think of the Node.js and, and the benefits of it and, and how relevant it is in the production environment? There's some use cases out there, LinkedIn's doing some stuff with their mobile app. You know, how much of this is real? Where's the upside? How much work needs to get done with Node.js? Is it ready for prime time? Pick, take your choice well, of that. Many questions take, there. Take your choice. <laughs> so, Jump we, right we, in. We've, um, so for one thing, event-driven programming, we've been doing it for a long time. We've been doing it with Inktomi Traffic Server, that became Yahoo Traffic Server. We donated to the open source community as a Apache Traffic Server. Um, we sustain in between 75,000 and 250,000 connections with each of these nodes, uh, which is super. So the event programming mode works. It's very complex when a programming developer, from the actual programming standpoint, not to completely mess up your head with it. Um, now, for, for us, we had enough of this technology. As a matter of fact, all our recommendation systems, our targeting systems, they follow a similar event loop programming, whether it's in C++ or in Java. Um, the issue for us, for Node.js, and actually Node.js was, can we shift the computation from the client side to the server side? And the reason this is important is because if you look at the last 40 years, um, CPU compute density has increased maybe a million times. Networks had only improved by a factor of 1,000. So, you know, the phone that we carry in our pockets could do what a computer could do maybe 20 years ago, uh, but the network is a little 3G. bit better only. <laughs> um, it's flaky, it reconnects, it yeah. keeps dropping packets, and the experience that you get is bad. So, um, you know, you cannot rely just on building apps. The apps are going to become disconnected at some point, and the question is, how do I build the apps so that they still work if they're disconnected? Um, our thinking is that we want the same code to run on the client on the server side. And that's what Node.js is interesting for us. It's not to solve all the infrastructure problems behind Yahoo that are very complex for search and recommendation. It's just for that stream layer that if it doesn't run on the iPad, it doesn't run on Android tablet, it runs on our servers and you still get an experience. Emerging markets, Indonesia, extremely important. What's the implications to you guys? Have you, first of all, how, many, how much Node are you doing at Yahoo? A lot, a little? Dabbling Quite a lot shipping. and growing. Our, I mean, we call the program cocktails. Um, our strategy is to keep growing, adoption, uh, all the new properties that are being rolled out, 
they're going to come onto the new stack. We, we're going to target what we call continuous experiences. Mm -hmm. It's not just PC, it's not tablet, it's not iPhone. It's something that you, know, you start one place, you move to another place. It's continuous. Uh, all of that is basically going to be based on cocktails. It's going to run on our Manhattan uh, cloud platform. It's going to run using Mojito as a JavaScript model B controller framework. Uh, full bet on Node.js and JavaScript as the technology that will enable us to do this. Have you guys thought of um, taking some of this great code and expertise and bottling it up for as a product to enterprises? No, we thought about making parts of it open source to create further community and leverage. You know, this is a problem during the panel that we just had. There was a question about JavaScript frameworks. Um, and it's a very good question that there isn't anything good right now that you can do client and server side. We think we have something good, we're going to open source it to try and grow a community around it. It's good for us and it's good for a lot of people that will be able to use it and contribute. In terms of enterprise software, we want to provide a service. We're going to provide a cloud-based platform as a service for these mojits, those mojitos, those lifestyle style applications that people can create for publishers, the likes of Forbes, Source Interlink, ABC News, and so forth. So really the consumer focus, not business to business. That's, so their they're yeah. publishers are business, but yeah, they're. Yeah. It's they're, kind of, I know that whole consumerization of IT, right, is happening. Yeah. I mean, it actually is happening. <laughs> Although it's not just bullshit anymore, it's actually happening. Uh, and that's the challenge that the big IT shops have, is that they really want a Yahoo-like environment without all the headaches that you guys went through. So that's what's interesting about Joyance I and mean, these new approaches is that they want that web-like scale that you've had to, through brute force, build and Facebook and Twitter. And so what I'm trying to tease out is what your key lessons were that you learned there from a development standpoint. Because not, a lot of these companies don't have that background. They don't have the background in developers. Most of them have outsourced it mostly and don't really, they have administrators basically that sit inside. So the challenge is the app market's exploding with developers like here at Node.js, what is available. So I was trying to tease out uh, how real Node is uh, through this thing and I, I, I'm sensing that the developer uptake is good, how would you peg that uptake in terms of the developers? Would you say on a scale of one to 10, 10 being obviously totally mature, a one or two or it, three? In terms of the developer uptake, up, the pure uptake on developers, I think we're probably not at three. Um, it's a very fast, very exponential growth. Um, it's one of the hottest technologies that you can be currently investing on. Um, it has a lot of promise, it has a lot of hard work to put on. Uh, we put a lot of hard work to basically harden it, to be able to run search, to be able to run lifestyle, to be able to run the products that we do. Um, and we suspect that most enterprise houses, they don't want to do that the same way that they don't want to run their own publishing systems, they don't want to run their own CRMs, they don't want to run an ERP system. They just go and buy it or somebody runs for them as Salesforce, right? Um, we want to be exactly doing that, we built a good stack, uh, we call it the Yahoo Publishing Platform, we want to be start offering this to other publishers, and Node.js and Manhattan are that shim layer that will give them that connected device experience. So a couple questions, that, and then, you can, then we'll, can go on to other things, but Hadoop has been a big part of Yahoo's DNA with the whole um, background with Hadoop. Obviously Hortonworks, kind of a spin out there, got a cloud air out there, uh, but mainly Hortonworks, a lot of ex-Yahoo. How much Hadoop do you have in your infrastructure uh, is the first question. And then the second question is, to get some big time developers, what's cool at Yahoo right now from a geek standpoint? What's going on there that, that you can say, hey, this is a cool project. This is some cool development to attract those kind of developers. Mm -hmm. so, so Hadoop, Hadoop is very, so we still invest in heavily in Hadoop. Uh, we still drive in the community, we drive in the commits. Uh, we're working very closely with Horton, Horton Works and things like the, the next generation resource manager. Um, it's fundamental to our business, our, all our pipelines, data pipelines, our advertising, our recommendation systems, the front page, everything on Yahoo really runs on Hadoop. Uh, so that continues to be the case. In terms of the hot, exciting technologies, right? So Node.js is definitely one of them. We, we're working hard with it, we're working hard with JavaScript, um, but a lot of other opportunities in other areas, Hadoop being one of them. The things like our infrastructure as a service, our virtualization layer. Uh, you know, we have a private cloud that we're working on, very exciting thing for people to work on. Search technology, even though we're not on the deep web crawl search, we still need to search and rank items, structure data, 
web of objects and so forth. So people with an information retrieval background, extremely good place to be for very large scale problems. Pe things like edge technologies and network people, people who care about TCP and HTTP and networking and being as close as possible to the user. Apache traffic, et cetera, I was just mentioning, we have the next generation version of that. Leading technologies, Sherpa, Peanuts, which is our distributed non-SQL store. Um, you know, we've been leading, we published the paper in 2006 and we have innovated, we have a technology that is probably among the best in the industry together with the Cassandras and the MongoDBs that exist out there. And they can come and work in that technology. So in terms of technology, extremely exciting and a large number of opportunities that developers can join. You guys doing any HBase, a lot of HBase? We use HBase, yes, we do. Good experiences with it, I mean, it's very efficient, but hard to program, it's new. It's new. Uh, we you we've been there. <laughs> we've been careful about how people use it. Um, we're wrapping it with credentials. A nice API. You can only touch the H base. None of the IQ level. It's hard. I mean, but some, that's basically it. It's pretty hard. That's basically yeah, it. we're protecting developers from being able to use it directly. We're wrapping the usage, uh, but we have probably one of the largest H base deployments in the world. What do you use H base mainly for? Web crawl cache. Web crawl cache. Okay, cool. Uh, okay. Um, vision. Last question. As the social web becomes more and more mature, we're seeing things like just this cloud space here. You know, the Heroku get bought by Salesforce just a few years ago. They were a startup. A lot of the public cloud entrepreneurs in, the, in this area, uh, large scale PhD guys at Stanford getting graduating. You're seeing some maturity in this marketplace and you guys have been a leader in that. What's your vision for this world of, the, of social web and you know, the web, I really call it web 2.0 because it's really the web 2.0, um, but we'll say web 3.0 for the sake of another extra digit, but what's the vision that you see coming around the corner beyond today? So I will not comment on the product experience because I think that's become a Hollywood production game. Maybe you're good, maybe you're not. Yeah, yeah. Technology-wise, trend-wise, yeah. uh, real-time web is changing. It's going to change the way we understand devices. Devices are always connected now. Better or worse, but they're always connected. Uh, the ability to shift the cloud to the device itself, the ability to become real-time connected, your device becomes part of the cloud. We'll start to see that the storage on the device is actually joins the storage on the cloud. The compute on the device joins the compute on the cloud. And what you end up having in is I.O. Trans being transferred between these elements of a big cloud. It's um, data peers on a big network. Um, you know, you want to call it is peer-to-peer -peer synced real-time web or something like that. Um, so you're saying is systems programming is coming back into vogue. And it's, it's hard. It's, and it's, yeah. And yeah, that's so why things like Node.js are necessary for people so to grasp. So creating a simpler, simpler way to not to screw up HBase or, or real-time To expose the I.O. access to HBase, yes. exactly that. Okay, all right, Bruno, uh, thank you very much for coming on Side the Cube. That was a really epic last comment. Appreciate it. Thanks, Great John. vision. Thanks for coming on the Cube. Okay, we'll be right back live from San Francisco, Node Summit. Real-time web's changing everything, disrupting business creating opportunities for developers, and the word abstraction has been kicked around many, many times, and abstraction layers are good things, as we're finding out. So we'll be right back. I'm John Furrier with SiliconAngle.com. We'll be right back. First time on theCUBE, baby. Rock and roll. I think it's probably five or six times I've been on the Cube now. Right, you know, at first the guys are just fun to work with. Pat, welcome back. Hey, always a pleasure to be in the Cube. <laughs> hey, I'm about to go on the Cube. You never know what's going to happen. I'm uh, a three-time veteran of being on the Cube. Uh, I hope many, many more. Chad Sackets, Chad, welcome to the Cube. Dave, John, it's great to be here, man. I keep coming back because uh, great, insightful questions from uh, from uh, John and from Dave. What face melting? action have you seen here at the event? And I know there's a lot of it. It's a great vehicle to, uh, to communicate with a broad audience that a lot of folks watch. Great to have you back. 
Good job. All right, Craig Nunez, uh, VP of Marketing at HP Storage. Thanks very much for coming on theCUBE. When people mention theCUBE, they, they're like, oh my God, I saw you on theCUBE. And they're all excited about it. It's, it's, a, it's an experience, it's not just information. They experience kind of what's going on there. It's like real time, it's like they were there. That was like my going to the pleasure. gym. Boom, boom. Legendary IBMer, CEO of Symantec, and now CEO of Virtual Instrument. Uh, great to have you on theCUBE. So for CUBE to be here at a conference like this, that's got 15, 20,000 people, and sharing that live around the world, that's consistent with the way the, the world is evolving. So it's a wonderful media, wonderful media. John and Dave are amazing. I don't know how they keep everything in their heads the way they do. Uh, it's a great format, and we're obviously seeing that this notion of real-time coverage and a real conversation is what's driving us as a company. And I, I said very seriously, when the questions and the comments that we hear from from them and from all the different guests here directly turn into the products that we build. Yeah, that was my first Cube and uh, I really enjoyed it. There was the oh, rapid fire of questions. It made me think on my feet, but they were very thought provoking and really got me going on analyzing the, the greatness of Arista and the greatness of the Cube as well. John and Dave, the reason their approach works, they're not just guys you know, reading down the question list, right? Okay, next one, next one. They're, they're, it's a conversation, right? And it's, you know, they're going to challenge you. They're not going to settle for the, the marketing hype and the BS and all that stuff that the industry throws around. Come on, you got to hit them up on the HP question. A lot's changed at HP, some turmoil at the top, obviously, controversy. They're going to hold you down to the, the, the real facts, compare you to the choices our users have and have you respond to it on the spot, right? Thinking real time, and so that's real talk, not just uh, kind of a paper interview, I think. I'm John Furrier with SiliconANGLE.com, and I'm here with Dave Vellante. We are inside the Cube. The Cube is our flagship telecast. We go out to the events, extract all the signal from the noise, and share that with you. And great guest lineups. We've got CEOs, CTOs, with all the top executives, bloggers, thought leaders, venture capitalists. I'm absolutely stunned by, because I know it demands 100% attention for these guys to be up there talking to people about a wide variety of technology topics. I can't believe these guys can make it so many days in a row. So I'm wondering how long they're going to go home and pass out for after this. But it was incredible, they, they just do a fantastic job. If you're not having a conversation, then you're very scripted. And if you're scripted, then you might be getting the right words, but you're often not getting the whole meaning and the whole depth of the conversation to the fullest extent. I think this is a heck of a lot more authentic. It comes straight from the heart and the brain. Sometimes you might forget to make some of your points if you're not a real-time thinker. But I think from both from a participation and from a consuming point of view, it's much more real. Chris holds no punches. So I've been on a cube uh, a number of times, and I think the, the interesting thing about, the, the, about being in that particular venue in that format, they introduced me as, hey, I, hey, Hoff doesn't pull punches. Well, they don't either, right? They ask really difficult, uncomfortable questions sometimes, and you can tell people uh, and the positions and where they are uh, in terms of what they're able or, or desirous to speak of, uh, you can tell where they are on that borderline between kind of just, you know, honestly answering questions versus kind of glossing over them. And I, I enjoy being there because I, I don't want to say I'm outspoken, but I honestly answer questions uh, with, with the full intent of being able to be um, respectful to the people that I, I bring solutions to, right? If I whitewash this crap, you're going to turn me off every single time you see me on, on, on any venue, let alone, let alone the Cube. So I, I like being asked tough questions. I like answering them honestly, and that's a fantastic venue for doing it. Otherwise, you get on panels and you got a bunch of talking heads blabbing at each other, and it's worthless. Yeah, this was my first time on the Cube, and um, I really got a chance to get to know John and Dave, and, and they're really amazing guys. I mean, the, the knowledge that they come with, um, the topics that they could talk about, the people that they know, and just bringing it all together in this live broadcasting forum is just fantastic. I mean, I just love it. I'm like, I feel like a groupie or something, you know? <laughs> in, in this environment, you know, the social environment, the real-time environment where we're in, right, people look through the marketing fluff very quickly, and if it's not authentic, right, you know, they don't trust it anymore. So in this environment, I think it's a growing trend. Yeah!
Okay, we're back live in San Francisco, California, the Node Summit. Uh, Node.js is the story here. I'm John Furrier, the founder of SiliconAngle.com, SiliconAngle.tv, and uh, we're excited to bring you wall-to-wall -wall coverage of the interviews at Node Summit, entrepreneurs, developers, executives. Um, you know, we're all about getting the knowledge and sharing it with you via social media, and uh, my guest here is an entrepreneur, Joe Farner, who's the CEO and founder of uh, Inbound. Uh, uh, Inbox Q is in, a company, Inbound Score is a new product. Though, Inbound so. Score is a new product, Inbox Q, big data meets social web, meets connecting into the web. So uh, here, step up to the microphone yeah, a little bit absolutely. there, and let's talk about, uh, um, you guys are a startup, so you're seed funded, sure, and right. you're out in the marketplace trying to make things happen. That's exactly right. Well, what's the big uh, aha around big data and the new marketplace that we're living in right now? You know, so uh, we've been working on our product set for about a year and a half. Um, we started uh, down a different path, more uh, real-time web crawling, crawling, and then we started focusing in on social data. What we started to isolate is around two concepts. One is the concept of public data streams, so things like Twitter and some of the public Facebook data and making sense of that. And more recently, really trying to figure out what are these more private data streams that are proprietary to within companies typically and helping folks make sense of those. So an example with, uh, with our Inbox Q product, we focus on making sense of public Twitter data. With Inbound Score, we've started to focus on looking at these proprietary streams of data that businesses have coming into their sites like Inbound Sales Leads and helping them make sense of those using some uh, public, public data as well. So obviously the social web is uh, an environment that's really hot with this real-time node.js. And, and uh, you know, one of the things we talked about earlier with the CEO of uh, Heroku and the CTO mm -hmm. of Heroku and pretty much everyone else is, the new connected internet is changing everything. Absolutely. So there's a lot more lightweight data that's actually worth storing and using and it's being disruptive. What do you guys see in your area around big data meets social data? And so it's a disruptive force. Yeah, so one of the real big things that we're seeing with our clients, particularly in the enterprise, is they're trying to figure out how to make sense of that data. So there's been this, this first, and make it actionable, this first wave of like listening apps, things that uh, allow you to understand what's going on on these channels. And now folks are starting to move their focus in around how do I take the data that I'm taking out of a place like Twitter or Facebook and tie that directly to a business objective, whether that's a product launch, direct sales, lead generation, whatever it may be. So what's your product and what's your business model? So uh, with Inbound Score, the product um, helps businesses manage their inbound leads better. So effectively what we do is we take that inbound stream of leads that's coming from your website uh, contact form, we look at the email address and the domain associated with that, that lead, and then we um, append public and private data to that, and we charge folks for uh, processing those leads in that way. Um, and where are you guys going? What's the next step for you guys? Obviously, you score more funding, right. get some beachhead out there. What are the critical product challenges you have? Yeah, so I think um, we've spent the last year and a half in product development and really trying to understand the market. Now we're moving into the phase where we're actually you know, shipping products, selling, uh, building our early customer base. The next phase is really figuring out what are the assets we need to scale up into a big, massive, successful business. And so we think that that's proving the early business model and then you know raising additional capital around that and, and starting to scale up. So how did this all get started, you guys? How did you meet your co-founders and yeah, your so, team? Yeah, uh, so it's interesting. Uh, my co-founder and I worked together at a previous startup, um, an early social startup called Popular Media that did uh, viral distribution for consumer products. Uh, it, was, it predated uh, Twitter's massive adoption it created Facebook uh, becoming open beyond yeah, education. that was the so widget craze Remember that's right that it was all it was widgets and all email based <laughs> everything was email importers right um, and so I worked uh, you know I tell people in lots of startups there's like the yeah. traditional uh, org chart and there's the shadow org chart the shadow org chart is like the people they pull together when things need to get done and increasingly it was me and my co-founder getting pulled together on these shadow projects so we finally said you know we should just do this together um, we were part of Y Combinator about two years ago uh, and uh, that was an amazing amazing education and got us kind of focused on the social path and then uh, spent the last two years executing from there. Okay. And when did you guys get your first funding? So we raised funding in uh, May 2010, so about a, a, little, a little over uh, a year and a half ago. And, like a uh, Series A? Or? It was a, uh, well, I think some people call it a Series A, some people call it a seed. We're probably a small Series A or a big seed. Oh, yeah, round. preferred. Then, that's, right, preferred that's right, stuff. that's right, that's right, yeah. yeah. And, uh, and so we basically, uh, and then, you know, we've sort of just been uh, focusing on, on putting that to good use and, and cool. developing the right product. And yeah. you know Tim Connors, great guy. Absolutely. An investor in the company. Yeah. Um, Tim's an amazing guy, amazing product guy. Product, he's very founder-friendly, which uh, is, you know, my kind of VC. And, mm -hmm. uh, 
he's a sports fan, which right. we love Absolutely. sports at Silicon Angle. We run reruns, and you know the funny story about Silicon Angle. I was running some high school football content on Silicon Angle TV and didn't know it was on live, mm -hmm. and it was on the website. And people were like, hey, you got football highlights on there. All of a sudden, the number the number of uniques doubled. Right. It's like right. high school football <laughs> on a tech blog. It's just all, and it was all the offensive plays that probably out to high school, and it's just awesome. Awesome. massive traffic. So we love sports, and we'll soon be launching Sports Angle. Uh, a Very dedicated cool. sports thing. That's our next big thing. That's what I want to do. But I don't Excellent. know if we're going to have time. Well, Joe, thanks for coming in. Uh, entrepreneur in San Francisco. Uh, as you can tell, San Francisco is a place where you know, everyone hangs loose. The startups are very collaborative, a lot of experimentation. The Node.js is a real trend. Uh, highly accelerating path to market and uh, time to value for the startups. And it's an exciting opportunity. Thanks for coming on theCUBE. Well, thank you very uh, much for having me, John. Okay, we'll be right back in five minutes with uh, Top Dog at Yahoo, large scale systems to talk about Yahoo's challenges. Hi, I'm Alex Williams of SiliconANGLE here at the Node Summit, live with theCUBE, our world-class online news streaming service that we do at events like this, here at Node Summit with James. James Urquhart, how are you, sir? I'm doing great, man. It's so good to see you again. Good to and see it's you. It's kind of weird to be on this side of the discussion with you, having I been know. A, a fellow blogger for so long, but... Uh, um, but the, you know, great venue, amazing crowd here at the show, and uh, I'm really excited to be on the cube again. The last time I was on was a great time. So, what's up with Node.js and kind of your perspective of the world? Well, I, you know, one one of the aspects of, of Node that's really interesting it came up on the panel that I moderated this morning. Um, we had uh, uh, um, uh, Nojitsu and um, uh, Heroku and Azure and um, Cloud Foundry represented. Um, and we talked about past a little bit, and one of the things that really came out of it is, you know, the, in some ways, Node is just another language. In, um, you know, in the sense that there, there, there are things it's great at, there are things it's not so great at. But I think what's really exciting about, cloud, about Node in the cloud space is it's, it's a venting model and it's JavaScript-based nature. Right. Um, really makes it something that is quite portable and quite kind of um, reassemblable and componentized by nature. In fact, you heard a lot of the talkers uh, at the show talking a lot about how Node kind of gets you to break down to the smallest denominators right. as quickly as, as possible to make event management that much easier to deal with, to get you know, to help with things like debugging and deployment and other things. That's kind of the nature of where the cloud's taking applications in general in a lot of ways, in that um, because it's a very service-based environment, people are beginning to break down capabilities into smaller service units um, and, and, and then bring them together, compose them in different ways, yeah. in ways in, um, that may or may not have been expected up front. Node is a great representation, I think, of a language that takes this into account, um, not maybe not intentionally, but it, it does fit very nicely. And, and one of the things that um, Oren Teich said at Heroku is that one of the places we're seeing the Node version of their environment used the heaviest is in machine-to-machine -machine communications. Yes. They have a very high traffic level right. in machine-to-machine -machine communication. And to me, that's really kind of the next frontier. We've done the Web 2.0 thing, and it'll continue to grow. There's a lot of room to grow in that space. Um, you know, Facebook apps, consumerism, but really, you know, the, a big growing area is going to be this machine-to-machine -machine capability where now the the now the automation environment that that underpins a lot of 
um, uh, autom you know, traditional automation will become much more cloud-like in that it integrates with third-party components, that it that protects, takes information from some source that's not within the four walls of the company and begins to bring that together. And Node seems to be very well suited to that kind of Yeah, it, it, it does. I mean, and talking to people about how they're using Node.js, for instance, I was talking to uh, uh, Flowdoc, I think that's the name of their company, but they take uh, group messaging and activity streams, but they take activity streams from GitHub, right. they take it from uh, Jira, they take it from email, and they're going to add, start adding Twitter into it. And so Node.js is really, really ideal for that, as they right. say. And it seems like it's, you know, we're hearing a lot of it, you know, a lot of people t saying that it's great for that real-time communication. So that's what it's great at. What is it not so good at? Huh. Well, I think um, I think when you get into situations where where thread control, um, where concurrency and, and managing what's happening from a concurrency perspective um, gets to be a little bit more detailed and a little bit more fin finesse oriented, some the kinds of things that like an Erlang would do really well. Okay, um, I think that's the point at which nodes the venting model means it's it's much less predictable about what's going to happen when or whether you're even going to have work that is stacked up, intended to be completed, but it's not completed yet, right? There's, there's not that serial nature to it. It's much less, it's much more about sort of the flow of information through different things taking their, their part of it and then passing it on to the next thing. When you get into something where you're really getting into um, the need to really finally work at a high performance on a given processor or just in general on computing, um, I think that's the point where a lot of people would say there's some things that Node does that aren't the smartest things to do in those particular architectures. That's interesting. I mean, I, you know, that really then speaks to the need for really good tools, doesn't it? To really be able to see what's happening, you know, with a deployment. For instance, I mean, I think about, um, you know, Joint and the data visualization tools that they have, really to kind of see what's happening inside well, inside the network. And it's a, it's a big reason for something like Instratus to exist as well, right? So tell, tell me, let's talk about that. Yeah. So so Instratus is. Uh, uh, is the the leading enterprise cloud management solution, and by cloud management in this condition, we, uh, the situation, what we mean is the consumption of cloud. Um, so, as opposed to being um, a, is something that delivers a cloud service, we're about how do you take your applications and consume cloud services in a way that is um, uh, under control, uh, allows you to do some governance around who can do what, potentially um, financial controls. Uh, you're making sure that people uh, are only consuming as much budget as they're supposed to be consuming for something. And these are the problems that enterprises deal with when they look at cloud that are very, very, um, they're exemplified by the enterprise. A big difference being, um, in a Web 2.0 space, typically you have a few development teams, um, they have some number of processes, they're growing number, but they're, they're still a you know, well-managed number of processes, and, and the idea is they have to scale these things across hundreds or thousands of nodes. Right. The enterprise problem is, They've got hundreds or thousands of applications. Right. Each of which may scale on an average need of five to 10 nodes. Right. Right? But the problem is each of those applications have different owners, they have different um, requirements, they have different budgets, they different have different uh, uh, compliance constraints yeah. that they have to meet, policies they need to apply to the cloud environments right. that they run in. And so it's that bringing together the governance and the automation of the application from the application's perspective in a multi-team environment, in a um, and, you know in an enterprise environment that that we really focus on, and so we give you uh, you know uh, basically the one way to think about it is as a console for managing and operating applications in the clouds that you consume for those applications. So managing those applications inside the enterprise, and we're hearing a lot of popularity for Node.js in the enterprise. Is right. that one of the what are that's one you just outlined you know some real reasons why you know it it has viability there. What are some other reasons that you're seeing? That, that, that they're talking about. That, that enterprises are yeah. talking about Node in particular? Yeah, yeah you know, I, uh, again, I think the when you look at the, it, uh, the types of, of applications in enterprises, they span the full gamut end to end. One of the things that's happening is the cloud has introduced the ability to build some applications that were economically um, unobtainable, frankly, right. in the past. So a lot of big data. Right. A lot of the excitement about big data comes from the fact that you can now experiment with processing data in certain ways. And if it doesn't work out, you release the resources back into the public cloud or private cloud environment, 
and you try something else. Right. Um, and so there's a lot of agility and experimentation, a lot of things. Node fits into that really well because it begins to give you a very componentized way of thinking about the world so that as you have components that are successful, you can continue to use them, even turn them into services themselves. Um, and you can continuously begin to glue things together in different ways, a very agile way to, to find w solutions that really work. But this really leads to s some significant disruptions inside IT, doesn't it? Well, absolutely, but, but it's an interesting way of, of um, it's an interesting balance. One of the big problems that's going on is we're shifting from a server-centric operations world in IT, where IT was, you know, their number one thing was primarily operating servers to make sure that the applications got delivered and were, were available. Mm -hmm. um, we're shifting from that now to a world where instead of getting the server, putting the OS on, putting the applications on, assigning your identity to the server, um, you know, hooking it up to the network and, and, and measuring server things like CPU utilization and memory utilization, we're beginning to shift the picture a little bit to an application-centric world with cloud. Where when I come to the yes. cloud, I don't come with a server, I come with an application. I come with, and by application I mean it's some combination of code, data, and or config, and or policy, that um, makes up something that turns that cloud service into something that's useful for a specific purpose, a specific application for your business. And so from that perspective, um, um, one of the things that's happening is, is that there's still a need for a lot of the things that IT did, but with a different focus. You still need operations. Right. You still need um, overall architectural advice in terms of how to put the pieces together into a system that's going to work and right. that's going to survive. Right, that data design, you, 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 the data management. To a certain extent, you still need all those things, although I would say that, that, that trying to do one data model for the company is kind of a dead thing in the yeah. cloud world. Because right. if you integrate with one third party service, all of a sudden they're defining data yeah. that you don't have in the data model. And if you change that, then you, you know, your data model is constantly changing. I think, though, the idea that of having an idea of what the components are, what the data is that's available overall in the mm -hmm. organization, having most importantly an API layer that allows you to then bring together the pieces that you want in one way or another, and that API could be, you know, direct call APIs, REST APIs. It could be events. So it could be any number of. So things. how is this representative of this like evolving DevOps culture? That, you know, I mean, there's a lot of marrying here of like developers and operations here. Right. It seems to be quite representative. Well, and again, it depends on the company. I think the argument that we're making is for most enterprises, it won't make sense to have your developers operate their own applications. Um, for a lot of enterprises, that your best developers, you need them to be able to bounce from project to project and do what they do best, which is develop code. However, you may want them to be involved in the development of the automation logic around the applications that they deploy. But once you've done that and you deploy that into the environment, you now need to be able to monitor and make sure that th that is working correctly and be able to tweak the automation of the environment, so that when you run into situations where the application either um, is is hit performance-wise or is unavailable, that you're able to adjust to those situations and make the the application that much stronger. So where that really comes, in, you know, the DevOps part comes into play is we, we have great tools for development. We have great tools for operating a data center. Right. We don't have great tools, or until now, don't have great tools for operating the applications that were developed in any arbitrary data center, right? That hasn't been a focus, and cloud's forcing that focus right now. Um, and so we think we have a, a you know, a, a, a really important solution that, that almost every enterprise is going to need um, from the perspective that you're all going to have applications running on multi-cloud. What's that solution? Tell me about it. Well, I think, again, I talked a little bit about what Instratus is about, but really, you know, we, we offer a SaaS version of the environment, on-premises version right. of the environment. It's basically the, the um, that gives you the ability to sort of say, define what your application is, looks like, um, define what the components of the application are, how that can be brought to bear into um, the cloud, um, and, and what are the configuration scripts that, that need to be executed in different situations, how can I, what are the right configuration scripts for one cloud environment versus another, and how can I make sure right. that those get triggered. All those um, nuances. <laughs> And then do all of that in an environment where you can define, this is the team that should be allowed to launch servers for this application. Uh, this is the team that should be able to um, um, you know, st stop the application or start the application. 
um, or start components of that. Um, this is the budget they have to work with. So for this particular part of the application functionality, um, you know, they're allowed to have up to 50 servers, and if they go higher than this, then we need to go address that and figure out what that means. Um, it also has uh, some feedback mechanisms to make sure you understand what the application is doing in the environment. And by the way, when I say environment, it could be one cloud, it could be any yeah. one of the 14 that we support, or it could be multiple clouds so that we can help you deploy that same application to part, run, say, you know, one tier with some of it running on Amazon and some of it running on Rackspace. I, so that yeah. you get that incre increased availability uh, even if one cloud entirely goes down, or, or cross regions, or whatever it may be that you want to do. Are, are, you <laughs> seeing, are you seeing that more often now? Where companies are using multiple clouds, is that is that is that I, a trend that's that is establishing itself? I, you know, I would say that the, the truth of the matter is is that at this point in time, um, I, the I theory, wonder why you the would. The theory is somewhere. established. Yeah, the theory is established that the the more regions, you know, the more data centers yeah. you can use, the more you increase your resiliency. But on top of that, um, when you have dependencies within cloud environments as well. If you have multiple cloud environments that don't have dependencies with each other, that increases the possibility of availability more. Mm -hmm. A good example of an availability event that um, uh, being in multiple regions in one cloud wouldn't help you with is, is if that cloud provider for some reason went out of business. Right. Or if that cloud provider for some reason was suddenly um, you know, uh, uh, told to shut down by the government right. or, or, or in a data center you're using in some country. Right. So, um, what we want to do is make sure that, um, you know, for disaster recovery purposes, for for just general availability purposes, perhaps even eventually for market purposes, that you, you get a better price over here, so maybe it's time to start up some more nodes over here where the price is better than over on the other one where the price isn't as good. Yeah. Um, those kinds of things are things you can do when you have an environment that's independent of the clouds that you're operating against, but they can actually operate an application against that cloud. And again, right now the focus is a lot on infrastructure as a service, but we're really excited about the idea of platform as a service and of, of languages like Node and others that make sense for this to come into play um, and to be able to operate your applications in much the same, with all those same traits uh, at PaaS and infrastructure as a service and so on. So PaaS is an interesting kind of, you know, is, is a good segue here to talk about. We're seeing, you know, today we talked to Dot Cloud, we talked to Op Cloud Foundry, we talked to Heroku, you know, you know, cl Cloud Foundry is you know most is a hybrid really, you know. Yeah. Um, Dot Cloud is fully public, Heroku is fully public. I don't think they have any hybrid capabilities. Um, what where are you seeing? You know, what are you seeing in that marketplace right now in that landscape, and in, in how you see it reflected here with the discussions about Node.js in particular. Yeah, I think the uh, Oren Tyke put it really well this morning when he said to call it nascent might actually be a little bit of an understatement. I heard that, yeah. Um, and I think that doesn't mean that the technologies aren't mature and that you can't build production right. systems on that. What that means is the form that the past marketplace will take um, and the ways that you will consume it are still being discovered. Right, um, yeah. And so, uh, so I think the answer is, you know, you look at something like uh, Microsoft's strategy with Azure, uh, what they're beginning to look at in terms of the, the private cloud capabilities they're bringing to bear. Um, you look at what VMware is doing with Cloud Foundry. Um, you begin to look at what the possibilities are with someone like a joint um, or, uh, or even potentially with Heroku, if, uh, but, but knowing Salesforce, I'm not putting a lot of weight into the fact that they might come out with a private cloud version right. anytime soon. Right. Um, but the, uh, the, the, you know, you, you begin to look at that and you begin to say there, there, there's definitely an understanding of going to where the, the enterprise sees the requirement for the application components to exist. But right now for certain classes of applications, if you're going to try those types of applications, it makes a ton of sense to run them in the public cloud anyway. So big data is, is one. Um, I think you see a lot of Web 2.0, the consumer websites for marketing um, purposes, uh, uh, you know, uh, community sites, social sites that get developed in um, in the public cloud for the most part anyway, because you can experiment with it. And, and again, if things go down, you don't own the equipment. If, the, if things don't work out, um, and I think you're starting to see, you know, I mean, even even Google App Engine, which hasn't been mentioned a lot because it's here right. because it's not a Node uh, environment. But you look at the types of applications that are being built out there, and there's still a huge demand for that. And I think now, whereas infrastructure as a service spread its wing from its core base two years ago, 
I think now passes at that beginning point where over the next year to a year and a half, you're going to see it find the other classes of applications it does well and find the models that it needs in order to be able to address the enterprise, to address you know, other types of applications, machine to machine systems and those kinds of things that, that begin to come down the pike. Um, and so you know, I'm, I'm very excited about what, what, what's coming in the space because I think we haven't seen all of the aha moments in the past space by any means. Yet. Right. Um, the the issue the, the issue that we that we hear about is you know these business critical apps and I mean that's been discussed as something that enterprises aren't willing to do but there is more movement isn't there toward you know starting to use maybe I'm not sure what the environment would be t you know for it but are you starting to see examples of business critical apps I mean there's SaaS applications that use as business critical apps but like I'm thinking about like the 20-year-old systems that companies have been using and they're thinking, wow, this infrastructure is just costing me a bundle. Yeah, I don't think you can look at it that way because I think when you look at core systems that are, um, they're core to the business but they're not differentiating, mm -hmm. the decision to go grab a new environment to run something that you've already made the investment in is a that. lot harder to yeah, do that. You right? can't, you can't However, rip and replace. When you look at new applications that are becoming core to the business, or, or they're becoming um, mission critical to the business, um, you know, I would say that pick any Facebook game developer and ask them, you know, is this, is this a mission critical application for your business, yeah. right? And there's a lot, there's a ton of those that are running in platform yeah. as a service environments, infrastructure as a service yeah. in general. You look at the big data and how it's becoming increasingly important to business decision making, to financial services, to um, uh, even government. Um, and you begin to say, you know, some of these systems are becoming mission critical. They, they're, they're, right now they're not contact, they're, you know, they're, they're not uh, context, excuse me, they're, they're, they're core. They're, they're, these ones are the mission critical ones. The context ones that I was talking about earlier, I think I used the wrong word, but um, those, those applications are, uh, you know, those are the applications will be slower to move, although the SaaS world, I think, will eat those up. So I, I don't think you're going to see a lot of people develop new non-differentiated applications in the cloud. I think they're going to find people who built those for multiple um, tenants. Well, that makes sense. That, that, that does speak to... A, a direction for platform as a service when you put it in those terms, in terms of the context of what is really mission critical. Right, and I think, you know, one of the things that I've argued, and, and I've, I've backed off of this, but for a while there I was arguing that uh, the only pass that will really survive in the long term is pass on SaaS, meaning platforms that were built to extend SaaS environments because that's where the data is, right? So the, right. the data that you gather, that's your core customer data, that's your core sales data, that's your core um, ERP uh, resource planning data, that stuff ends up in a SaaS environment. You're going to want to write the applications that consume that to do your dif mission, um, your differentiated stuff um, yeah. against where that data resides. Yeah. I think there's a little bit more to it when you look at different kinds of businesses. Some will actually use standalone pass for certain types of applications and it makes sense to do so. But I also still think that, you know, when you look at a, a force.com, you have to right. really respect what Salesforce did early on there yeah. in understanding that they, I mean, there's a lot of businesses built on force.com that are built on salesforce.com data and uh, that are quite successful. And I think that that, uh, that that's something that will begin to expand out and you'll see a lot of, you know, that's why Cloud Foundry is somewhat interesting to me and Microsoft to a certain extent as well is not only are they multi-language, but in reality they could take the exact same platform and have, you know, you know, have somebody in a SaaS world spin up a Cloud Foundry pass to support their platform and have me have my local enterprise Cloud Foundry environment, and I can then pick and choose how I distribute components across those. It just passes the data yep. into the application where it's integrated. And you just put the code where you want it to right. go, and it's consistent, in theory, consistently operated um, uh, and executed across uh, the, the two different environments. Salesforce.com looks pretty smart then. I think I think Salesforce.com is, is is very smart. I, they're not the you know the only smart company in the space, but they're the one but that comes you have to, to look at them. You have to look at them when you look at SaaS. And, and sort of the leadership in defining the space in the same way that Amazon really has defined um, infrastructure services and services as infrastructure. Um, I think you've, you've got to really give Salesforce credit for defining this is what a, a true software as a service environment really is and, and really operates. Um, and, and there's still sort of the, the benchmark by which I personally, and I think a number of other people, compare other SaaS environments against. doesn't mean that, that some of the others don't hold up quite well against them, um, and it doesn't mean by any means that they're the only game in town when it comes to CRM. 
or, or enterprise uh, or enterprise software in general. But um, boy, they you know I, at one point in time I said Microsoft and Google were the two companies I looked at that that I, I would put money down that ten years from now they'll still be a major major you know play. Yeah. Um, now I would include Amazon in that picture. I probably push Google down a little bit, although yeah. they're getting their legs back again, so they'll be back. But I put Salesforce in that place. So I'd say Microsoft, Salesforce, and Amazon, those are the three companies Not that VMware. 10 years from now, they have a lot of great technology. They, they obviously had a blowout quarter yesterday, right? So I could be wrong, and I may change my mind about this. But in reality, right now, their business is still largely VMs. And I think they have yet really to prove themselves as sort of having having defined a space in the cloud space that really makes them um, a marquee player. In do you that think way. they can move up the stack? I mean, that's obvious. You see well, that. they're going to do that with Cloud Foundry. I think Cloud Foundry and, and Social Cast. And, Cloud Foundry, and, in my my opinion, will probably change that story. They're, the one thing they have in their arsenal, in my opinion, um, that will really change the story for them in cloud is the success of Cloud Foundry and their ability to build a business around Cloud Foundry. Um, the, the, I think it's a little early to declare victory there, though. But they did a, it was a, it was a very phenomenally smart risk for them to take to do cloud yeah. foundry. It's um, it's interesting about, you know, this discussion about platforms as a service and the SaaS integration and, you know, this rise of really the these developers who have just become just such a force in, in building apps, be they independent or folks who hack after work, you know, and stuff like that. I, that just, isn't that what's, that's the driver, isn't it? Is it? I mean, yeah, I've got to say, this, this may be one of the f first real movements where startup success with a new approach um, has put significant pressure on enterprise. Um, if you look at a lot yes. of what happened with, uh, with web in the early days mm -hmm. and find server, it was the success of enterprises and beginning to really identify how to use hyperlinking, how to use, how to use client server, right? Those things generally came out of the overall enterprise world trying to solve problems for the enterprise and then they, they, they bled out into, hey, wow, this creates a whole new marketplace for websites. Mm -hmm. um, in a lot of ways, I think this, when you look at cloud, the phenomenal success of startups in the cloud space um, has really opened the eyes of the enterprise world to what's possible outside of their own four walls, and the enterprises are now struggling to, to get to the point where they understand how to address that and, um, and how to take advantage of the same things. You see it in big data already. I think there's been a lot of success in big data, um, and a lot of enterprises beginning to understand that there's value there to be, be had. Um, infrastructure is a service to a certain extent for certain types of apps, but I think that we're, we're seeing um, uh, you know, we're going to see an explosion from enterprise of beginning to understand what it means to them to be able to, to be very component based on the approach to AT, very application focused rather than server focused in the way they do things. Um, yeah. And, that, and yeah, it, it's all about the, the little developer. Developers are the new kingmakers. I think, I think Stephen yeah, O'Grady says yeah, that, Yeah, Stephen right? O'Grady says that, And, yep. uh, and I think that... Um, I think it's right. You know, I think that that's absolutely true in the cloud because cloud is an application-centric operations model like we were talking about earlier, right. not a server-centric operations model. So you made the move from Citrix to a startup. How, how are you enjoying Actually, it? Actually, it was Cisco. But Cisco, excuse me. <laughs> I mix the Citrix and Cisco up. I'm sorry. Not, uh, not really I mix them up, but, but uh, you, you know... Cisco, how how uh, how is that transition? Well, I, I you know I've worked for startups before. I, I like the the somewhat established uh, startup culture uh, quite a bit. So I'm I'm having a blast. This is a really good time. Um, I'm doing what I want to do. I'm focusing on the problems I want to focus on. Um, I have the opportunity to make this work. Um, you know, by by uh, by having some some real strong say in, in terms of how things turn out. Um, I'm excited about that. I think you know, I'm, there are things about large companies, about the resources that are available, about the benefits, and those kinds of things that that certainly um, that are are very strong pros on their side. But the ability for for me to go and make a couple of phone calls, and 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 sit down with the person who's going to make a decision about a key part of our user interface, or um, or whether or not we should uh, integrate with this, a certain partner, and being able to say, um, you know, the, here's my argument for why we should or shouldn't do it, and have that be acted on is phenomenal and and you know at a company like Cisco uh, you have to you have to spend some time setting up a major decision before it gets taken on right so this is the great thing about a startup life that, that uh, I'm really enjoying right now and hopefully it, it it won't be a startup life for long and you're spending most of your time in the valley then 
Uh, no, I actually work from home quite a bit, which is really nice. I mean, we're, we're one of those. Uh, what what I about call you're talking and you spend most companies. of your time in the region. But I, but I spend most of my time in the Bay Area right now, although uh, the company's based in Minneapolis. So I, I go there occasionally. Mm -hmm. I'm going there tomorrow and mm -hmm. going to freeze for yeah. a couple of days. Yeah. Um, and then, uh, but, you know, it's, it's uh, um, we're expanding worldwide. We've got the New Zealand office, uh, development offices in place. Where we're oh, going to cool. open up some uh, development offices in, in other countries soon. And uh, and we we live online. We know how to do this as a company. Uh, um, everybody is really enjoying the culture that we have, and uh, and so we we intend to continue doing that. And the California office will grow as well, and uh, and eventually we may we may do office buildings. Who knows? So we, 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 but wow, uh, wow! At this point in time, or you know, well, offices. But at this time, uh, we're we're very much being very agile, and uh, it's fun. It's a good time. Well, James, it's great to see you. Thank you very much. It's a pleasure as always. You're going to keep blogging though, right? Oh, yeah. I'm, I'm blogging on Gigom uh -huh. uh, now. And so you can find me just about every other week on average uh, uh, on uh, the Gigom cloud coverage. Um, and uh, I'm going to start my own uh, personal blog again here pretty soon. So people can watch me on Twitter, James Urquhart on Twitter. Uh, and uh, and uh, when that launches, I'll be talking a lot about uh, the science of complex adaptive systems and how mm -hmm. that applies to cloud computing, which is all about how things can survive in a... In a in a changing uh, environment, and and uh, f um, and how developers can help them do that, and uh, and uh, yeah, I'm, I love blogging. I'll, that that won't stop. Anytime it's how soon. you learn, right? It's well, it's one way you learn. Yeah, it's how you learn. Yeah, exactly. Well, good. Thanks, man. Well, have a good trip. Thanks, I appreciate that. Talk to you soon. Talk to you soon. Well, we're here live uh, from the Node Summit here in San Francisco, California, where we're in the first coming to close to the end of the first day of an event that really, you know, seems to be a defining one in the developer community. This is the first Node Summit I, that, that I, you know, that, that's been here. Um, there is one coming up also in, in Portland, Oregon. Um, but the people I'm talking to are really, uh, really getting a lot out of it. We're really glad to be here. We're going to be here for, uh, for the next day or so, interviewing more developers, interviewing you know people who are, you know, on, more on the business side of it, which is which I think is a good balance there. Um, one thing that uh, you know we look we we look forward to is continuing to talk with you, James, and you know, and talking with people like you, you know, who are really kind of you know leaders in their field and 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 really doing a lot of interesting things. So really appreciate you having you know, having you on here. Thank you. Um, so I think we're gonna we're gonna take a we're gonna take a break. And we'll be back and you know real soon, live from the Node Summit. I'm Alex Williams uh, with Silicon Angle. We'll be right back. The Cube is this conceptual box, if you will, and we bring people inside of the Cube and then we share ideas, but those ideas don't stay inside the Cube. We explode that idea. We allow that idea to grow and grow, and it does. So we really try to own the whole enterprise technology space. I mean, that's what we're all about. We take analysis, we take publishing, we take news, and we take live TV, and we combine it together in a product and share that with our community.
no one's doing what we're doing. Uh, what we're doing, in my opinion, is the future of media, the future of television, the future of the internet. Video is an amazing, powerful product. So we work in what John and I talk about as a data model. People always say to us, well, how do you guys make money? We sell knowledge, we sell information, we sell data. So the problem that we, are, that we identified is about what we call big, fast, total data. Anybody can analyze a gigabyte of data. If you do a thousand gigabytes, that's a terabyte of data. You take a thousand terabytes, that's a petabyte of data. A thousand petabytes, that's a zettabyte of data. So you are talking big data, lots and lots of data, and can you analyze it in real time as it comes in, right? The Cube is like we call ESPN of tech because we want to cover technology like ESPN covers sports. John has a great vision for what's going to happen next in tech. And so John is sort of that alter ego of mine that lets me see the future. We have a really amazing team of people that work with us. Michael Sean Wright, Mark Hopkins, you know, we've got Kim here today. We've got a team of people on our news desk uh, run by Kristen Nicole. So she has a team that help feed us the news of the day, what's happening, the analysis. We have a team of analysts, and they feed us information about what's happening. And then, really importantly, we have a community, a big community of, of many hundreds of contributors. We love technology, we love, we love the innovation, and that's what we do. We want to create a great user experience. And in order to do that properly, you've got to really, really prepare. The Cube for the past year that we've been in operation has been very, very successful. And uh, you know, companies do pay us to come here. I think the companies who have bring us in with the Cube get two things. They get a third party independent resource to provide knowledge to their audience who are seeking it, this demand for the, for the product. And also complements their existing media. Uh, we're here at an event and uh, you know, the company has their own TV organization and they have to pay a premium for that. So we complement that by offering a objective, organic, third party, independent analysis of the event. That's why the top executives come in here. The Cube is a comfortable place. It's a place where people feel happy and are happy to share their knowledge with the world. And uh, we're happy to, to be ambassadors of, of that knowledge transfer. My entire career has been really built on relationships and talking to people and extracting knowledge from people, largely in a belly-to-belly -belly private forum. What theCUBE does is it explodes that to a huge audience. I mean, we've reached millions with theCUBE, and it's real time, it's live TV, so you've got to be quick on your feet, but you learn very fast, and then you iterate from that learning. So John and I play off of that, and we're constantly trying to up our game. Hi, this is Clint Finley with Silicon Angle. I'm joined today by uh, two of the people behind Mapbox. Uh, could you guys introduce yourselves? Yeah, uh, my name is Eric Anderson at Mapbox. Hey, and uh, I'm Will White at Mapbox. And I understand you guys, we're at uh, Node Summit today, and uh, I understand you guys are using uh, Node.js quite a bit in your application. Uh, but maybe uh, first we could talk a little bit about what uh, Mapbox is. Yeah, so uh, Mapbox is an open source platform that allows you to design uh, really fast and beautiful maps and then share them either on the web or, or on a mobile. So this, this basically means two things. One, there's a, there's a design studio called Tilemill that you can download. 
and run actually on your desktop. So you can take data, whether it's you know like a spreadsheet, whether it's OpenStreetMap data, open data from your city, and design a totally custom map. Once you have that map designed, you can you can share that anywhere. Uh, so we also run a cloud-based platform that allows you to upload that map and then integrate that map actually into your own application via via our API. So we're using Node actually on both our desktop design application and in the cloud for really fast map serving. Okay. Uh, can you go into a little more detail then about how uh, how uh, Node actually fits into that? Yeah. 